Now, before we get into the wonderful passage of the scripture we're going to read this morning, let us first bless the word of God. You can say it with me. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the word of truth and has planted everlasting life in our midst. Blessed are you, O Lord, who gives the scriptures. Amen and amen. Now let us open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, where we see the Sermon on the Mount. Lately, I've been following the news in the U.S. as the elections are soon coming, and what is most striking is the sharp division between the left and the right. You know, listening CNN and then turning to Fox News, one gets such diverse and even contrary analysis of the same event and of the same person. You know, at times I wonder if they're analyzing the same story. But, but this contrast is not only in the news, it is found in the Sermon on the Mount as well, as Yeshua will bring out the differences between the things of God and the things of this world. Two different yet parallel worlds, the believer is here reminded to consider and not lose sight of this chasm that separates them, and to always stay close to God and not drift away. And, and while the words and the illustrations of this sermon are given in such simple and understandable terms, here our teacher, Yeshua, is going to challenge our thinking. He's going to confront us and bring us out of our comfort zone, even to the limit of our understanding. There he puts the demand, the bar so high that we're compelled to always look to him for help. And this is not the first time, by the way, that the Lord brings us to such a point to realize God's high demands. In fact, here we can recognize the Spirit's blueprint. His strategy in the scriptures in dealing with men. Back, if you remember, in Genesis 22. After waiting more for more than 25 years and at the age of 100, Abraham finally had the promised son who would continue to carry all the promises of redemption the Lord had previously given to him. In Isaac, by the way, laid the messianic line, but then God told Abraham to go and sacrifice his son. But how could Abraham reason out this demand and how can a father do such a thing as to sacrifice his son? To Moses, the Lord asked him to go back to Egypt after he fled from it and there to confront the mighty Pharaoh and bring his nation back to the promised land. But how could Moses figure out such a formidable task? How can just, just to appear in front of Pharaoh and usher three million people to the promised land just the logistics to get these people with their flock out of the country is unthinkable. And then to the disciples, as Yeshua was teaching of marriage, if you remember, and putting it to such a high level, the disciples concluded in Matthew 19.10, he says, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it's better not to marry. Forget it. The demands are too high. When Yeshua told them about salvation in the same chapter, they responded, they said, but who can then be saved? The process and the demands were so elevated that it seemed impossible for anyone to be saved. And here we will see that his requirements in the Sermon on the Mounts are of the same kind. Here he is asking us to love our enemies. This particular statement, this I want to tell you, this particular statement is exclusively biblical. It is new, there's nothing in antiquity like this. But how do you do that? Here he is asking us to lend without expecting to be paid back. And to even give our code to the one who takes, who stole our shirt. And listen to this powerful statement. He tells us, give the other cheek. Uh, how do you do that by the way again? It's so unnatural. Furthermore, there he even tells us to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Matthew 5.48. This is the coup de grace. Like, can we ever be perfect as God is? Never. So what did he mean by these commandments? For they are commandments, by the way. By the way, do you see the plan in there? Do you see the plan he has for us? Yeshua's strategy here is in fact simple and very effective. 
It is the same as the one behind the whole of the mosaic law, which he expounds here in the sermon, and which was designed to show our inability to fulfill God's requirement. Like it was with Abraham, Moses, the disciples, in the Sermon on the Mount, he reveals our powerlessness to live according to God's standard, unless one fully abides in God, unless one seeks his help all the time. With him, the impossible becomes possible. The impractical becomes achievable. And we are not left to ourselves to figure out these things. Right at the end of each of these commandments of the demands, Yeshua stands as he himself fulfilled each one of them for us. Behind each of these requirements, we have the ultimate example of one who lived them. He not only, by the way, spoke the words of the sermons, he emulated them, he incarnated them, he completed them. Later he would say, I did not come to annul the law, but to fulfill it. It is in this sense that he did until he was on the tough, taking all the judgments of this law unto himself. So the disciples were right. It is true that no one can be saved. It is impossible. It is impossible unless there's a miracle, the miracle of salvation. It is also true that no marriage can find its full potential and function properly without a touch from God, without the intervention from the one who created it, without his presence in those three bread or woven strands in the relationship. And it is also true that no one can live the life that God designed for us unless there's a miracle that is the miracle of sanctification. When the Spirit of God dwells in us to direct us and to convict us of sin day after day. You know, if I had to choose one verse in the Scriptures as a title for the Sermon of the Mount, I would choose Genesis 18.14. From our father in the faith, Abraham. Is anything too hard from the Lord, he says? I mean, the Lord says... Nothing really. When we walk with him, live with him, this is what makes the Sermon on the Mount timeless. Yes, it is written for each one of us today. And together, these seemingly impossible commandments from a picture is a picture actually of a mature believer. Rabbi Shaul, Paul, who understood it well, he said, For when I am weak, then I am strong. 2 Corinthians 12, 10. Strong, you know, this comes only after realizing our inability to properly live without God. Now, before we get into Yeshua's words, let's put the Sermon on the Mount in context. What is the occasion of this sermon? Why did Jesus find it necessary to address this issue right at the beginning of his ministry here in Matthew? When Jesus came to earth, he was confronted with a completely new religion. That of the Pharisee, or the the rabbinical Judaism, which he called in the gospel the traditions of the elders. It was so different from the faith and belief of the people of the Bible that Yeshua told them that they were transgressing the word of the Lord by their traditions. Matthew 15, 3. And so Yeshua came to restore what was lost. He did not come to bring a new religion, but he came to bring us back to our roots through the pure Word of God. For going back to the Word of God for a Jew or a Gentile is like one going to find the God they were seeking or the Father they sought for. It's for all people. This new religion of rabbinical Judaism took about a hundred years to develop before the coming of Yeshua. It began with two rabbis named Hillel and Shammai, and from there a new set of beliefs developed that is contained in what is called the Talmud, where we find the traditions of the elders. I want to tell you why there are many good things and wise things in the Talmud and very valuable historical facts to even help us to understand the New Testament. The Talmud is not the Torah. It is not inspired by God. Nor is it an interpretation of the Torah, nor is it an interpretation of the Hebrew Scriptures. And this is what Jesus is demonstrating on the Sermon on the Mount. 
To them, Jesus said, you remember this passage, we, we mentioned it a few times this past few weeks, John 5, 46, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. That is, if they knew the Torah, they would believe in Yeshua. This statement shows another great difference between rabbinical Judaism and biblical Judaism. Two different religions. And many today in the Jewish community, as it was at the time of Jesus, are often under the impression that the Talmud and the Torah or the Talmud and the Hebrew scriptures are the same. They are not. You know, a couple of years ago, I was invited to a prominent synagogue not too far from this congregation building. They, they heard about us on the radio and they saw the evangelical team on the streets and going door to door. And so they asked me to come and explain the reason for my faith. I did. And I want to start by saying that it was a great experience. They are wonderful people. And so as we begin, the very first question they ask, if Jesus is really the Messiah, how come the rabbis did not believe in him? How come the rabbis today do not believe in him? And I thank God, for, for, for I could not expect a better question to open up the scriptures to them. This is when I brought them to consider the history of Israel. The biblical history and told them that a very similar question could have been asked to every single Jew throughout history. Because throughout time, the civil and religious leaders were always at odds with God. This is a major point in the history of Israel. Jewish tradition agrees that most of the prophets of God were constantly rejected and even killed. And rejected by whom? The very religious and civil authorities were still asking the same question. Didn't Elijah think that he was the only believer left in Israel after they rejected and fired all the prophets of God? Where were, where were the priests? Where were the teachers of Israel? Like at Amos. He was asked actually to leave the land of Israel because he proclaimed the word of the Lord, which so disturbed the king and the people. Jeremiah, you know, Jeremiah did not just fall into a pit. He was put there on account of the message of the Torah he brought to the people. But the very same thing happened at the time of Jesus Yeshua, who spoke the same words as the prophets and also was rejected by the religious leaders and the civil authorities. And what we learned from the history of God's people is that God's truth is often found in the small minority. When it comes to spiritual truth, the majority does not always hold the key. After this, I'm going to tell you, Sharon and I expected to be kicked out of the synagogue, but praise God, we were not. And the session lasted over two hours, you know, with many more questions. But it is... This difference, this chasm between this world and its many religions and the pure word of God that Yeshua is bringing out during the Sermon on the Mount. And he stresses the contrast. You know that 14 times within this sermon, he repeats the word, I say unto you. This, they might have said this, and they might have said that, but I say unto you, always bringing us back to the root, to the beginning, to the word of God. And the people understood there was like a revolution in there because the, the others, the religious ones, spoke in mysterious ways, often pretending to know hidden things. But God never speaks in secret. He said it in, in Isaiah. At the end of the sermon, we read that the people were astonished. They were amazed at Yeshua's teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So comprehensible, so anointed his words are. Let us now begin to read the Sermon on the Mount. It begins, I'm going to tell you, in a great way. Look at Matthew 5, verse 1. So when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. So Yeshua went up the mountain. But which mountain is it among the many mountains in Israel? We're not told, but this is perhaps to bring us to make a correlation with Moses, where, where at the moment of receiving the law, we're told six times over that he went up to the mountain, six times over in Exodus 19 
and up to 34. However, here Yeshua is going up the mountain to speak and amplify the same law. And this time, he takes us with him. Now see how powerful the words, the first opening statement are. Matthew 5, let, let us read verses 3 to 5, and then we will have time only to consider the first one, really. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Notice the word blessed. You know, it is found nine times in chapter 5, like the nine gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12. These blessings and gifts are a present from God when we walk with Him. Now, for the word blessed, you know, before we see the Greek, we, which has much to tell us about it, this time you know that the English word is mighty powerful. The word blessed comes from the Old English, blessien, which itself comes from the word bloodison, where we get our word blood. The idea is that the one who is blessed is one who has been hallowed with blood, blood that is, and marked with blood, just like the Passover. This is such a fitting word for all these great blessings contained here and only possible through the redemptive work of Yeshua. Again, while the bar is so high and the demands impossible for man to fulfill by himself these commandments, however, through Yeshua, and his death and resurrection were able because we are blessed, because we have Yeshua in us. As for the word, the Greek word, makarios, in secular Greek, by the way, it defines happiness of a, of a life beyond care, right? A life of possession, especially because the word really means rich, to have many possessions. But the Bible took it over and uses it some 50 times, connecting it to the fruit, the outcome of salvation. We see that in 1 Peter 4.14, where he tells you, us, that is, you are blessed because the Spirit of God rests in you. It is attributed to the one who endures, who works in his sanctification. It's last mentioned, by the way, in Revelation 22, 14, where we read, Blessed are those who wash their robes, that is, so that they may have the right to the tree of life. Wow. And this is what Israel needed so much at the time because happiness was not running in the streets as the Jews were under Roman dominations and under the very heavy load of the Pharisees. But Yeshua here offers us and them and us, that is the way to happiness, not through the sword, but through love, as he is going to demonstrate. By the way, the Hebrew equivalent for the word blessed, hasari, right? Are, are, are the, these are the first words of the book of Psalms. Hasare ha'ish, blessed is the man. Psalm 1, by the way, emphasizes our relationship with God. And so does the Sermon on the Mount. There's a strong correlation between the two, as both brings us again closer to God. And through these blessings, we're given a portrait of the person of Yeshua, something every believer is called to imitate, even as Paul puts it, you know, to put on the Messiah. Go on, put on Christ, put on the Messiah. Let's look at the first one. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? It surely doesn't mean to be feeble or helpless, but it defines one who recognizes his or her dependence on God and fully rely on him in humility and humbleness. It is this condition where our strength lies. But see that this is who Yeshua was. You know when he said that something really incredible, he says, I can do nothing of myself, John 8.28. Or when he says, the Son of Man do nothing of himself, John 5, 19. This is being poor in spirit, and yet he's the most powerful being in the universe. While he showed us this humble state, he also spoke to the storm and quieted it right away. He spoke a word, and the demons fled from him. He commanded, and the leper was cleansed, and the blind saw right away. 
And yet, he gave us such a great example to follow, for he was poor in spirit. This is the part of Yeshua we ought to follow. And see what he promises. Something the Jewish world was craving for at the time, and even now, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is major for the people at the time because they expected the physical kingdom of God to be established. You know, at the time there was, according to Josephus, the Jewish historian from the first century, he says that there was, that there was a strong end time favor because the people knew the prophecy of Daniel, Daniel 9, 24 to 27. These prophecies, because of these prophecies, false messiah actually came out. The first in history, because they knew the word. But <laughs> they knew the word, but the Pharisees didn't. The Sadducees didn't, if you remember. And these false messiahs were so numerous and were com competing with Jesus. You know, in the book of Acts, testified of two of them, if you remember, you remember Judas and Judas of Galilee, Acts chapter 5, who took up arms to deliver Israel, thinking they were the anointed ones. But they were killed, and so were their followers. However, the problem is that the people expected the coming of the Messiah to deliver them from their enemies. They were taught about the second coming. They were not taught about the first coming. Even the disciple could not figure out at first. But I want to tell you, it is the same thing today. The people then expected the second coming and disregarded the first. And this phenomenon persisted until this very day, today, in our modern Jewish communities. You know, back to the invitation we received to, uh, to explain our faith at a synagogue. The second question they ask is, if Jesus is really the Messiah, how come there's no peace on earth? And I thank God for this question too, for it gave me the, such an opportunity to further open up the scriptures to them. I reminded them of all the hundred or more messianic prophecies of the first coming, which tells us that he will be rejected, that he will be persecuted, that he will die and resurrect. I reminded them that according to Zechariah 9.9, he first comes on the back of a donkey before he comes on the back of a white horse. I also reminded them of Isaiah 53, this powerful passage which speaks of the people's rejection of the Messiah and how he suffered and how he died for us and how also he resurrected. You know, Isaiah 53 was a prophecy that ancient rabbis before the coming of Jesus understood as being messianic. We see it in the Targum. We even see it in the Talmud, by the way. I also reminded them of this important prophecy of Zechariah 12.10 which says that when the Messiah comes back, for he comes twice, I told them, right? The nation of Israel will recognize the one they have pierced. This, no one taught them. In the same way, the people of the first century did not expect a dying Messiah. This is why they rejected Yeshua. This, I want to tell you, is the missing link into this Judaism. But they ought to know that he first comes to die and then he comes back to establish his kingdom. And the Hebrew equivalent of poor in spirit has much to tell us. It is spoken in Isaiah 57, 15. The one who has a contrite and lowly spirit, right? And this is what, where the Bible says that this is where God dwells. It is with this individual. We'll close with this, actually. Look what it says. For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy, I dwell on high and holy place, and also with a contrite and lowly spirit. And this is the condition of the believer today, for whoever has accepted Yeshua as their Savior is now sealed by the Spirit of God. He or she becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit where God lives. This is, I want to tell you, such a great privilege. You know, next time we we'll look at the rest of those blessed words, to sum up what we've seen so far, is that the words of Yeshua really brings us to reassess our belief, our position with God, and see we are, if we are, that is, at the right place. We are surrounded with so many religions, traditions, and a multitude of supposition and assumptions about who the Messiah is. But it is everyone's responsibility to go and see God as he reveals himself in the word of God. 
No one would be able to bring his rabbi or his priest or his religious leader with him when he will be face to face with God. God has left us such beautiful words contained in the Bible and it is there where we find salvation and eternal life. It is there where the Messiah is revealed. Nowhere else. The idea comes from there and there we see his first and second coming. And I will tell you, his name is Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our head in prayer. You know, for the prayer today, I will pray part of the Sheva Berachot. That is the seven blessings pronounced at a Jewish wedding. The seventh has to do with heaven. And since we believers from Israel and the nation are the bride, we will pray these beautiful words. Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler over the universe, who created joy and gladness and myrrh, glad songs, pleasure, delight, love, fellowship, harmony, and companionship. Lord our God, let there soon be heard in the cities of Judah, in the cities of the whole world, the sound of joy, the sound of gladness, the voices of the groom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the groom's jubilance when Actually, he comes to take his bride. Blessed are you, Lord, who gladdens the groom with the bride. And so, Lord, some here today need healing. Some need revival in their hearts. Some need restoration in their friendship. Some need <clears throat> to realize the power of your forgiveness so they will not carry such a heavy lot of guilt. And for those here this morning, Lord, who, who wonder if they've been left behind, who fear you've forgotten them, show them through the gentle touch of your Ruach HaKodesh that your delays are not denials. May we learn to wait on you and may our strength be renewed day after day. And to the congregation, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May the Lord bless you all. Amen. Oh, mm -hmm.